In this video, we're going to take a look at the experiments that really began uh, to help us understand the atomic nature of matter. In this section, we will describe the contributions of Thomson, Goldstein, Millikan, and Rutherford, as well as the experimental uh, data that uh, backed these contributions, and we'll continue to emphasize how scientific understanding changes over time. Around 1900, J.J. Thompson was working with a Crookes tube. Um, that is a cathode ray tube, so that means he was working with beams of electrons or beta radiation. He would do experiments where he would take um, a cathode ray and apply an electric field to it or a magnetic field, and based on Maxwell's equations, they could figure out um, how much, um, or based on those equations and how much the beam of electrons deflected, they were able to figure out the charge to mass ratio of the electron. Um, they were able to get this ratio, but neither the charge nor the mass independently. Um, this would be like running some sort of an experiment where you could measure the density of something, but you could not get the mass or the volume independently. So you could get the ratio, but you couldn't get um, the individual numbers. This is a photo of an actual cathode ray tube in operation, and somebody has applied a magnet to it. Uh, the cathode ray tube contains a phosphor screen, and wherever the electron beam or the cathode rays are hitting it, the screen glows, so that's that greenish glow that you're seeing. And then once the magnetic field is applied to it, the, um, the beam is deflected from the straight through path. Based on his own experiments, as well as the experiments of other scientists, J.J. Thompson, around 1900, proposed the plum pudding model of the atom. Um, pudding, in this sense, is like a British pudding, which is more like a cake. And a plum pudding is a cake that has little bits of plum embedded in it. Um, for the United States in 2020, sometimes chocolate chip cookie is um, uh, used um, as a, a, a good example uh, where the chocolate chips would be the little bits of plum. Um, so the plum pudding model of the atom uh, says that most of the volume of the atom is occupied by positively charged matter that's just distributed throughout that volume. And then there are negatively charged electrons uh, distributed throughout that are very tiny little bits. Also roughly in this time frame of the late 1800s, um, a scientist named Goldstein um, discovered that um, in addition to the cathode rays that were flowing through cathode ray tubes, if you looked for rays going in the opposite direction, you would find them, and they were referred to as cathode rays. Um, in our mo modern understanding, uh, these are protons. They are positively charged particles, and they're going the opposite direction of the cathode rays. But the term proton wasn't invented until about 1910. Uh, so there's a little bit of a gap here between um, when they were discovered and our modern picture of them. In the meantime, they were referred to as canal rays. Around 1909, Robert Millikan did uh, what's known as the oil drop experiment. And so he took a little sample of oil, which is up here where it says atomizer, and he squirted the bulb and it sprayed a little bit of oil that um, went into a, a chamber where there was this little teeny tiny hole drilled. So just a, an occasional drop of oil could actually fall through that hole. And then any oil that made it through the hole got zapped with some ionizing radiation. And here's where it gets tricky. Um, the two blue plates that you see in this diagram um, were charged electrically to make a parallel plate capacitor. And once the um, oil drop was charged, the electric field put a force on that oil drop, pushing it upwards. And that countered the force of gravity that was pulling the drop downwards. Now, 
every once in a while, Millikan could get a drop of oil to just hover. It was just suspended and uh, or levitated. And he was able to look very carefully at that drop of oil with a telescope and measure exactly the diameter of the telescope. And uh, based on the, the diameter of the drop and the density of oil and a bunch of equations, Millikan was actually able to calculate the mass of an electron. I'm sorry, he was able to measure the charge of an electron. He then put that together with Thompson's work of the charge to mass ratio and was able to figure out the mass of an electron. Um, here very clearly is an example of one scientist building on the work done by another scientist. Also in 1909, Rutherford did an experiment where he expected he was going to prove J.J. Thompson's plum pudding model. This experiment is sometimes called the gold foil experiment. It's also sometimes called a scattering experiment. He had two graduate students working with him named Geiger and Marsden. And what they basically did was set up to shoot alpha particles at very, very thin gold foil. Gold has this wonderful property that you can pound it into extremely thin sheets that are literally just like, you know, 100 atoms thick. And so they thought that if they shot um, alpha particles at, um, at these atoms, that those alpha particles should go just straight through. So for instance, um, the, the vast majority of the atom, all of this red area, is just positively charged matter. The alpha particles should just pass right through it. If they got close to an electron, they might be uh, diverted just a little bit, but the alpha particles had so much mass um, that it'd be kind of like a, a bowling ball hitting a ping pong ball. The bowling ball would just continue on its way and the, the ping pong ball uh, might get bumped off a little bit. And so Rutherford, Geiger, and Marsden went into the lab fully expecting to see this. If they shot um, alpha particles at gold foil, the alpha particles should just pass straight through it undeflected. However, that's not what actually happened when they went into the lab to do the experiment. Um, instead, the uh, alpha source hit the gold particles, and the, the vast majority of it did just pass straight through undeflected. Um, Geiger and Marsden sat in a dark room with a microscope uh, trained on their detector, which was the zinc sulfide screen. Um, when the alpha particles hit it, there would be a flash of light. And so they just sat with this microscope counting flashes of light every time an alpha particle hit. Um, so they, they said, oh, this is great. We've got lots of particles coming straight through. Uh, but we also have to prove that there aren't particles being deflected at other angles. So they moved their microscope over a little bit. And they still saw some flashes of light, fewer than going straight through, but still there were flashes of light. They figured, oh, that's okay. There's a little bit of interaction here. Some of these alpha particles are getting deflected. That's okay. But the further away from the straight through line that they moved their um, their uh, microscope, well, the further away they got, they really expected to see that the flashes of light f fell off rapidly and even stopped, but that's not what happened. As they moved further away, they still kept seeing flashes of light. In fact, uh, they were seeing flashes of light as far backwards as they could detect with their experimental apparatus. So it looked like some of these alpha particles were hitting the atoms and bouncing straight back. This was completely unexpected. This is not what should happen according to the plum pudding model. Rutherford has a great quote about this. He said, it was about as incredible as if you had fired a 15 inch shell at a piece of paper and it came back and hit you. 
A 15 inch shell is like a 15 inch diameter cannonball. <laughs> so imagine that a 15 inch cannonball fired a sheet of paper and it bounced back and hit you. This was completely unexpected. Well, what happens in science when the experimental outcome is contrary to what you would expect? Well, it's time to change your model. It's time to change your theory. So according to the plum pudding model, all of those alpha particles should have just passed straight through and been undeflected. But we got to have a new model. And Rutherford proposed something known as the nuclear model. So the red is representing um, all of the positive mass of the um, atom. And with our new nuclear model, all of that matter, all of that positive matter is condensed down to a very, very dense nucleus. The electrons are still roaming throughout the majority of the volume of the atom, but all of that positive matter is now concentrated down in the nucleus. As the alpha particles come through the atom, if they pass through only the area where the electrons are, they're still going to go straight through. However, if one of these alpha particles happens to hit the nucleus, it's going to be deflected at some angle. So the nuclear model can explain the results of Rutherford's gold foil scattering experiment. Let's revisit the objectives to um, wrap up this section. We looked at the contributions of Thompson, uh, Thompson, Goldstein, Millikan, and Rutherford, as well as the experiments behind these contributions. And we looked at how the concept of the atomic nature of matter changed over time.